we could. All right, we're going to call this building this meeting of the school building committee to order. Today's uh, April 27, 2023. Um, our first item on the agenda is approval of the April 13 minutes. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? Thank you, Mary. Is there a second? Okay, Tony, thank you. Are there any corrections? Seeing none, then all in favor of approving the uh, April 13 minutes, please indicate. Any Aye. opposed? Any opposed or abstentions? Uh, Rich will abstain. Okay. Uh, that brings us then to the opportunity for public input. Is there anybody that would like to address the building committee? Seeing none, we will move on. Um, something we've added to the agenda now, since the um, the school is now occupied by the district and we have children in there, we've added the a superintendent update to start with. So um, Peter and Richard and I were at the town council. We have some slides that we showed there, and I think Peter would like to show those again. Yeah, I will pull those up. Uh, as the uh, slides are coming in, I just wanted to capture uh, just a slice of the energy. And I'm glad Rich is uh, here because he can uh, jump in as well. Uh, we had an amazing opening week. Uh, I just cannot thank you enough. Your vision, your tenacity, your advocacy, uh, five years has paid off. Uh, and what I thought I would do and, and what I did with town council is talk about the human capital side, which is a little odd because you focus so much on construction. Um, but uh, there, there was also an underlying current of working on the human capital side because we had to construct uh, a support network that allowed us to have such an amazing opening. So here are some pictures of the cafeteria, students in the classroom. We had Thunder, the, uh, the tiger, who's our new uh, MES mascot. He was high-fiving and hugging and greeting the buses, um, but just uh, an amazing uh, vibration of energy uh, the first two opening days. Um, here is a, a timeline just to give you an idea of how much work happened on the human capital side of it. Really, we started working on this when Lauren was appointed principal of the new elementary school in the fall of 21. Uh, and, you know, Lauren endeavored to meet with every single staff member in the consolidated new uh, MES one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. That was a huge undertaking. She met with all grade level department teams at least three times during the year, created norms and common expectations. Uh, we created a field trip where students signed the construction beam in December. We had our STEM teachers uh, learning about net zero and starting to teach our third graders at the time how to be ambassadors and explain net zero. Uh, there were social events for staff. There was hikes and things like that. And in the spring, every grade level team had an opportunity to plan a field trip that brought all of the three elementary school kids together for the first time to start to create common experiences. Uh, cut to 22, 23, where we learned uh, how to be nimble and flexible and kind of be patient with the uh, delays. Um, but uh, I'm gonna say something that uh, probably is a little odd, but uh, I was just sharing it and, and some of us have been reflecting. Thank goodness we did not open up in August. Um, there was a lot of work we had to do. And I, I'm almost at the place where I would tell other districts, planning a mid-year move is actually not a bad idea because people were able to teach into the experience uh, and have time that summer would not have afforded us. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you get lemons, you make lemonade. Uh, the MES staff uh, and team made uh, a huge pitcher of lemonade that was just so sweet. Uh, and so through the 22-23 school year, we made sure that we use this time with our video tours, our campus tours, bringing our community into the space, either virtually or physically. And again, having those uh, student field trips 
And then, uh, you know, Rich would be able to elaborate that um, there were teacher leadership teams helping to imagine all the things we need to think about in that new space. So we had our April break, tons of moves, and then the soft opening, uh, which was just great. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of slides from our opening days. So Tuesday. I, uh, yeah, it's off from here. I advanced before. Hold on. Oh, they'll catch up. I'm going to escape. Um, so Monday after April break was a professional learning day just for MES staff. It was a day for teachers and staff to get her done. Uh, you know, we've got company coming on Tuesday, um, but there was a whole host of activities that happened before that Monday. And here are pictures. So in our uh, Vinton and Goodwin campus, we had tons of boxes in classrooms in the hallways. On Good Friday, uh, our contracted movers were amazing. Um, they stayed until nine o'clock at night with facilities, making sure everything got moved and adjusted. Um, we invited um, the middle school staff to help. Uh, that's a picture of two middle school staff members putting up a bulletin board. The uh, yellow bathroom picture is a kindergarten team on a field trip before we open, learning how to use the facilities, how to, what door are you going to come into the school? Um, how do you eat lunch here? Um, all of those were like experiences that allowed us to have a successful opening day. And that last slide is a professional learning day with teachers in the Great Hall uh, listening to the work and culmination of all those leadership groups. Uh, Rich, make sure you jump in if you have anything, and, and I'll pause at the end. Tuesday uh, was our first day with kids, and it was grades two, three, and four from Goodwin. And there's Thunder waving to the kids, high-fiving. The PTO had stayed the night before, creating a surprise red carpet balloon arch. Uh, and... The kids entered as if they owned the space. Uh, they just walked. They knew exactly where they were going. Um, and they got right uh, to work. Um, and then in the afternoon, uh, Lauren and leadership team, along with community support, provided kids with a uh, musical concert and an outdoor activity, just trying to buy a little more time for staff to stay in their classrooms to meet and do some final tweaks because we knew that once you see your kids in the room, there might be some desire to move things around. And then on uh, Wednesday, we had our pre-K kindergarten first grade. I kid you not, that picture on the left, I, Rich, I think that's uh, Kelly's classroom. Right? I think they're first graders. Uh, this happened at 9.15, 9.15 in the morning. Like, so they own the bench. They knew intuitively what to do. They had their books out, their reading. And I saw that in every single classroom. There was no classroom and no student who was spinning and wondering where to go or what to do. Uh, in fact, it was it was kind of scary on Wednesday because uh, in one of the uh, kindergarten classrooms, uh, they were just absolutely quiet doing their tasks. And I was like, not even like a wow or oh, my gosh, you know, it's like it was like, no, we're here to work. Um, and so that just shows you the intentionality of the staff to lean into this experience to make sure that kids knew this was just another day of school. Um, but don't be fooled, like the duck who is just floating, you know, those legs are madly paddling underneath. And uh, there was a lot of work. Our teachers were incredibly exhausted after the, the opening. They've, uh, some are probably exceeding 20,000 steps per day. And, and uh, the great Staircase is providing a lot of exercise. Uh, on the right is that movement break um, that uh, was provided using the art outdoor space. And then we had Thursday and Friday, and I'm going to use air quotes, normal days, one building. Uh, teachers were relieved from what I heard of like, okay, you know, no more tiger, no more musical. It's just we're, we're going get, to get, uh, get to work. Uh, and in fact, one fourth grade a student said, do you think we could just do math in the afternoon today? Uh, you know, again, uh, kids uh, thrive with uh, on normalcy, consistency. And but I just look carefully at those pictures. Every nook and cranny of that building is being used 
all the time and for all the right reasons and for all the things you imagined, the flexible seating, the breakout areas, uh, the floors, the chairs, um, all of them supporting the collaboration of our teachers and staff members, supporting our STEM enrichment related arts, supporting morning meeting. I love this picture of a student reading in the library or the learning commons. Those are uh, wood cross section pillows. So uh, really fits the theme of the net zero building. They're pillows, but they, it looks like a, almost a photo of, of a cross section. So they're pretty realistic. Um, so last slide is just gratitude. And, uh, you know, there, there's two in particular um, groups that I just think about all the time. One, the school build, building committee. Um, you uh, have just stayed the course. Uh, and Randy had shared something that I find very unusual, that uh, a town committee with such a large lift and very little change of membership, uh, that's outstanding. Um, and, and I think the other group that I think about all the time is the collective MES community. Our educators um, embrace this. Um, and uh, even though they were challenged at times, and even though they had to do extraordinary things, it was uh, game day and they brought their best selves each and every day to make sure that our opening was so successful and that uh, with confidence, I can tell you that uh, just this morning, um, life goes on as if we had this building all along, which is pretty amazing. But uh, it takes a village. And uh, during that opening week, we had tremendous support from facilities, food service, IT, uh, the middle school staff, the Historical Society set up a display of the history of uh, schools in Mansfield. If you're not aware of that, I will tell you that Consolidating building schools is as old as Nathan Hale and Mansfield. It's an interesting read, but we've built and consolidated often, and it's been hard for the community throughout, uh, you know, the hundreds of years. Um, but it was nice to have that support to help us fill in, and uh, you know, right down to state troopers who uh, were running radar on a road that has not seen that in a while. So please slow down uh, in that area. Uh, so, Rich, uh, please, I want to save space for you and jump in. Microphone. Yeah, so first of all, kudos to administration. Um, I know I've shared the story with some people. I remember when I was in elementary school, we moved mid-year. We moved in November, and it was basically one day you are at one school, and the next day you're at another one, and it's all brand new. You've never seen it before or anything like that, so... The, you know, the, all the thought that went into it was just amazing. The thought, all the planning and, you know, and that came from above that came, that was administrator administration decisions and, you know, and, and thoughts. And um, so the kids really did come in thinking that this was home. You know, they, they were like all the alternative sitting, they were sitting in places and, you know, pulling out the, the, the cushions and, and the, I call them Ottomans. I'm not too sure what they are, but they love them. And they, you know, and they just kind of like, it's like they've been there forever. Um, and, and I can't believe that I'm there. And every day I'm teaching and I look around and go, holy God, we did a really good job on this building. <laughs> I have to say that um, I can't believe I'm in this space and I can't believe I'm teaching in this space. And it just, it's, it's so exciting to be in that building and to, um, it's a big building. But it doesn't feel like a big building, which is the thing that, that I think about every time I'm walking through. Yeah, it's taking you a while to go from point A to point B. But when I'm in that first grade cluster, it's like we're in this little school at the same time, which is really cool. Um, but I, it's just phenomenal. It's I, I can't even put it into words right now, but job. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, uh, and then uh, I... I just a couple other things. Um, Tony had brought this up during uh, uh, town council and uh, certainly is not on my list, but is in my heart each and every day. Uh, Kelly Lyman obviously uh, deserves so much uh, credit for uh, being a leader who had vision and helping the town figure out a way 
uh, to not only uh, lift up sustainability, um, but to think about what is the best move in terms of our uh, aging infrastructure that'll support kids and teachers, but then elevate this idea of 21st century teaching learning uh, with the flexible spaces. Uh, and I know Paul Shapiro also was uh, a giant that we stand on uh, his shoulders uh, and uh, appreciate uh, their advocacy and leadership. So uh, Kelly's in Germany right now, very jealous and uh, will be visiting soon. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, very last thing is the ribbon cutting ceremony. So I can share some dates with the uh, school building committee. Uh, it will be uh, Friday, June 9th and 10th. It's a two day celebration. June 9th uh, will be in the morning. That's when kids are in session. That will be an invitation only, uh, obviously, school building committee uh, front center, but we'll make sure uh, and take time to have you weigh in on who are those special guests to make sure that they're uh, a part of this. The governor uh, has been invited, the commissioner of education, uh, and we'll continue to build that out. Um, but that will be a traditional ribbon cutting ceremony where students and staff will be there. Um, we, we do hear a lot from you know those who uh, led this work. Um, and so we want that to be a special inclusive event, but not necessarily open it up to everyone. Um, and then uh, we'll conclude Friday with uh, tours for our uh, invited guests. Uh, there'll be a light reception. And then on Saturday will be a community facing celebration from 12 to three, we'll open up the doors, we'll have music, we'll have food, vendors, we're inviting all our uh, uh, town agencies, community partners to set up tables. We really want that to be kind of a just a town celebration and we'll have our uh, ambassadors out and we'll use our campus maps and tours and all the tools that we built. So everyone gets a chance to, to be in that building. Fantastic. That sounds fun. Um, are there questions for uh, Tony? Ms. I Sorry. would just like to make sure that as part of the ribbon cutting ceremony that Randy gets adequate recognition for the leadership he's given over the last five years. Um, this really wouldn't have happened without having a committee chair who uh, was not only effective in running our meetings, but directly involved in the day-to-day -day kinds of work, including pushing folks when they needed to be pushed and uh, uh, thanking people when they needed to be thanked. So uh, I do hope that there is some attention to his leadership. Absolutely, front center. Okay, now I don't, I don't know what to say now. <laughs> I'll jump in, I couldn't agree more. Um, I also wanted to ask Peter and Rich, um, I'm so just delighted to hear how at home and how good it feels. And do you feel like it's the right size? Do you like, I love that you said it doesn't feel big. It feels small, which is, was one of our drivers at the beginning. Right. And we heard a lot from the community about, we don't want to give up our small little schools and go into this big, huge. Um, so I loved to hear, I loved hearing you say that part. Is there enough space for everything we wanted space for? Is there ever? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, when we put an addition on our house, you know, we talked about how big the closets should be. And then we decided that the bigger the closet, the more stuff you accumulate. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, in the, in, the, in the ideal world, you can make it big, it's big and big and big and big and bigger. But at the same time, like, like I'll just talk about my classroom space. Um, Perfect. Um, it, it takes a retooling of of how you're looking at things. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, for example, like I was like, oh, wow, I have so much stuff. I have so many books and bins and they take up so much shelf space. And then I realized, but if I take the books out of the bins, they don't take up that much room. <laughs> you know, like so. It, it, so I think part of it is adjusting to the new space. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it is, you know, changing the paradigm a little bit. Mm -hmm. how, how are you going to store things? But but then it's also looking at the storage that is provided to you, like it, another paradigm shift, like, you know, those tubs of blocks that I had on shelves, but I have all that storage that comes with, with tubs that you slide in. And so 
moving all that stuff into those into those units it's like wow you know like there's a lot more storage yeah. than you realize because you just have to do a little bit of a mind shift in terms of how you store things mm -hmm. because in the old schools we had very little storage as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. but it was configured differently yeah. you know deeper shelves maybe in deeper cupboards but that meant that you had stuff in the backs as you know that mm -hmm. you didn't see mm -hmm. until you moved to classrooms again you're like oh i own that yeah. you know so so it's just thinking of rethinking how you're using your storage but like i'm very happy good that that speaks well to the actual moving in right because like you said in a house that's what we all do we get in there and it's like this is all going to go here <laughs> and then you live with it for a while and say oh that wasn't a very good idea <laughs> yeah um and space for everybody professionally wise i've heard people tell me in the community that you know, certain people aren't going to have their own classroom. And I keep assuring that we, you know, our ed specs were there from the beginning and we did all the things that the state required that we do and not to worry, everybody will be okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, however, like a new house uh, or like a new car, uh, it comes with some things that you're just not used to. Uh, we know that the building design is challenging us because we were somewhat uh, land rich in our smaller elementary schools. Remember, enrollment was declining. And so people got used to available classrooms that typically wouldn't. Uh, we also were mindful that we wanted our teachers to collaborate and not to create silos and spaces where you can hide, but to create places where you are really encouraged, if not forced, uh, to work together. Um, and so there are some uh, that feel the challenge of that, that, absolutely, that in the older school, if I was a PE teacher and I had the whole gymnasium to myself and I made the decisions for that, it's it's a, uh, a learning curve to now work with another PE teacher to figure out how to share that space and how to create new professional norms. It's easy enough to do. Uh, but it's hard in the moment sometimes. And so you, we're, we're living that sometimes. Um, but overall, the building supports all our programs, uh, including just that robust, very Mansfield idea of we don't want to lose ground on our programs and our support of the arts. Uh, and so we're figuring out those ways of how to do it. But the state was pretty tight on some of our asks, right? We, you know, not everyone was a winner. Right, we had to make some strategic choices, uh, and then I just want to add to um, Rich's point. You know, schools are not museums of old stuff, uh, and I think moving out really uh, opened a, lo a lot of eyes of how much stuff that we have accumulated over time, uh, and that we've lightened that load. That we're shifting to more of an electronic, um, online kind of school and being more intentional. And we even had teachers who had packed boxes knowing for sure they were going to need this. And they said, you know what? I haven't needed that box. So I'm not even going to open it. I'm it's not even coming into my classroom. So even right up to the 11th hour, teachers are making good decisions to lighten up with the materials. Go ahead, Tony. Every once in a while, I would hear that there were disgruntled staff, faculty members, and others. And sometimes people would say, oh, once I see the new building, they'll be converted. Are you still dealing with disgruntlement? It's a loaded question. It's it's a challenge, right? So I, I don't want to, it's the duck, right? The duck is floating, bobbing along, smiling, got the little ducklings behind them. Uh, but I, I, I would be, uh, Miss, if I didn't share that, you know, it we're in a new place, uh, and that requires some careful thinking. Uh, and it doesn't matter who you are and what you're doing, from the front office to the back loading dock, to the gymnasium, the art spaces in Richmond, everyone is having to think differently, and that's not a bad thing. Whether you're disgruntled about it, uh, I think is a matter of like, you know, uh, just acknowledging how tired and and how much work it required to move. Uh, the totality of the past three years cannot be dismissed, right? From pandemic to post-pandemic to delays and uh, the alternate locations, we've not really had a break. 
we, honestly, we've not. Uh, and so this summer when I've asked Park and Rec, uh, please don't use our building. I don't want anyone to pack or clean. I don't want, you know, I want teachers on the last day of school to walk out and have a summer vacation where they're not thinking about those things. Wellness is so important to us. Uh, and we know that we've asked a lot uh, with this. And so I think it's it's that, you know, some days you just are a little short on patience uh, as you are learning. Okay, other questions for superintendent? Okay, yeah, I, was, I really appreciate hearing that, Peter. It was, um, it's the culmination of a lot of work and, and it's good to hear that um, you know, everyone's settling in and um, excited because uh, I was there opening day. The mayor was there. Um, it was fun. It was fun to be there that day when the kids were arriving and there's so much excitement. Uh, okay, we'll move on then to uh, contractor architect OPM update. Um, it wants to go first. I don't know, Steve, you want to go first or Adam, you want to go ahead, Steve. You're, you're on mute, Steve. I see that everybody's settling in. Um, as far as our reports are, there's tweaks in the building as, as people start moving in and growing and use you, more common use of the building than it's sitting idle as it has been for a couple of months. So we're actively... Um, working with Bill and Alan and their staff to identify these tweaks and look at fixes and different options. Um, there was a pressure issue this week. Um, one of the BF um, from Island Tank um, that's being replaced, the bill. Uh, we lost you, Steve. Hmm. Oh, there you're back. Can you hear me? Yeah, we lost you momentarily. Yes. Yeah. So basically, there's some you know growing pains in the building as people have occupied as as typical happens with buildings, and we're proactively dealing with those issues as they come up, and and resolving them as as quickly as we can. Um, and that's really it. I mean, we've got um, our psych guy out there. There was a flood from this rain event from last weekend. Um, swales a swale was regraded silt sacks that probably were filled with silt over time have been replaced to try to eliminate that for this weekend's rain event um some door hardware issues that i know bill is dealing directly with um, um asa abloy with i've been on the phone with asa abloy um, relative to sensitivity of some of the hardware that was specified and and i think they're making a change material at their expense and i think bill's offered to do these fixes with retractable latches um, which makes it a lot easier to use and less likely to have to tweak or maintain so said we're moving things along i mean speak benny's on vacation and you know how vital he is Right. So, um, we're uh, kind of dealing with all of that. Okay, thanks. Um, the the uh, entry to the gym door is there a, a plan in place for that? Yes, we are attempting to schedule it the Memorial Weekend, and we have that worked out. Um, fix get Bill uh, Mike Minto down there for his final sign off, and that should be the end of that. And I think the only thing that would be left is the replacement uh, panel cover for the uh, solar um, panel. Right, which is that's we're just waiting for that to arrive. I think it's July. Yeah. So there were there were I think four items for the CO that had to be taken care of, and so the the panel is the last one. That will be the yeah. last one. Yeah. Yep. Steve, uh, what is the um, what is the fix for the gym door? got to rip the landing out again and, and redo it kind of work the deal out with uh, Richter Segan um, with some flexibility on their end we're able to do what we need to do and raise it in half an inch 
that um, Mike is looking for on the transition from, from the exterior. Got it. Thanks. Yep. Ryan has so, a question. I guess just to, because I was going to ask the same question, but just so as a follow up to that, I understood after the last round of discussion, Steve, that, or at least I thought I understood that the plan was to basically cut a section of the, the the block out, basically beginning at the gym door and extending back to that that first drain. Yeah. It was like a couple feet. So is the plan yeah. to still do that and, and replace the whole block? Or are you just raising, you're cutting the block, but just somehow raising and feathering in the existing no, block? Ryan, that's an option that I don't necessarily like at the time. I would prefer to replace the whole landing and not have a joint at the trench drain. Oh, the Richter Segan said that would be fine. I just need to know how complex it is to, to bust that concrete up and how concrete surrounds that trench drain. If I go around it and start chopping it, I'm afraid that we may destroy the trench drain. And I think that's the argument that BB's making right now, that if it could be very evasive. Now I'm stuck having to buy a new trench drain. And you know how long it took to get those. So. Yeah, it's a work in progress. We'll come up with a plan and, and, and present it on Benny to an SK as what the ultimate uh, decision is. And we'll go from there. Thank you. Tony. Uh, I'm wondering what the impact of the week's rain has been. Not only um, uh, you mentioned some swales, but there's the quote unquote pond. Has that reappeared or have has that problem been fixed? Pond has reappeared with the rain that you guys got up there. Um, we had a considerable amount of washout from the hydro seeding over this past weekend, which is owned contractually by our um, landscape contractor until um, this is established. And he's been fully engaged with repairs. Um, we've got the Richter Segan's report that will address we're today actively fixing things from that washout and should complete it tomorrow and report response tomorrow. Steve, you're cutting in and out at the moment. But uh, we needed we needed four inches of rain out there. <laughs> question for I'll, um, I'll jump in here too with that uh, so we just I saw it come through the uh, email strings here um, this just this afternoon there were some testing results that came through from um, from IMTL and Coastal uh, regarding the percolation at the bottom of the basin so Fuss and O'Neill the civil engineer is looking at that now and they'll assess what how that relates to the uh, specs and what that needs to what the re resolution is to fix the pond now that we can actually we actually had some weeks to actually see the bottom of it and do some testing there so they'll take a look at that and we'll develop what the final resolution is next week copy of that Adam yeah yeah I haven't even looked at it myself so I'll forward it to everybody yeah thank you Steve, last time we met, um, Ryan had mentioned that our town building um, inspector had been over and there was a reference to daylight streaming in through the doors. And that so was, that yeah, that was that same door. Yeah. Was how we had to pitch the threshold, um, compromise the weather stripping on the bottom. Um, and I think once we fix that concrete, and raise that up, we raise the ramp up and we could adjust that door sweep so there's no daylight underneath it. And on the upper right-hand corner of that door, the um, weather stripping ran short a little bit. Um, it's too long on one side and too short on the other. And our guys can actually fix that, but we kind of want to wait until we fix the ramp and do it all in one fell sw swoop. And that was the only door that he identified. He was focused on that door. Yeah. Um, so I guess my question is, if, if that repair isn't happening until the end of May, what happens between now and then if, I don't think we're worrying too much about heating right now, but if cooling needs to happen, 
How does that affect the efficiency of the building? Uh, we're talking about a quarter of an inch by quarter of an inch hole in the upper right hand corner and about a quarter of an inch by an eighth of an inch over the length of 38 inches along the bottom. Affecting cooling or heating all that much. I was more worried about water infiltration coming in from the gym. So whatever Fuss and O'Neill and that group designed, it seemed to work um, this past weekend. We had the rain anomaly between the beehive drain, the stone and the trench drain. So. I understand what you're saying, but I don't think there's really any negative system. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Stevie specifically? Okay, um, maybe Jeff, we'll let you, um, if you have anything to update us. I have nothing. I do recall vaguely though that Chris Kiefner had mentioned the art room. Uh, exterior classroom door has some daylight underneath that so, so i would check that as well if, if you could steve um actually just, jeff that one that one's all set now i saw okay. it myself it's good okay now i guess the only thing that i'm tasked with like well many things but i got a lot of closeout stuff i'm working on i got 22 submittals that are conveniently on pro core it looks like they're due soon so i gotta work on that this weekend and then gathering all the cad files so you know there's <clears> there's still some things to do here to on my end to get this thing closed out so yeah jeff those submittals are all close out submittals i believe right yes well there's yeah there's a couple of things in there let me just see what's in there uh, there's a yeah, i prefer on school stuff maintenance data warranties uh there's some balancing reports got a review um but pretty much as built drawings disinfecting reports warranties things like that okay any questions for for jeff Chris, uh, Chris McNamara. I don't know if this is the right time to bring it up, but um, sure. the, the discussion that we had at the last meeting about the curb cut in the front for the accessibility, is this a good time to talk about that, Randy, or not? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so the, the question was raised that on the bus loop, there's not a curb cut for wheelchairs um, near the canopy. You can go down kind of around the bus loop to where it goes down um, around the school. You can get on at that end. Otherwise, you have to come from the main parking lot. Um, so question, I guess, be for Jeff. Um, I mean, are there any rules against putting in curb cuts there and, or limitations or anything like that? Oh, there was an email that uh, our landscape architect had sent out. Let me see if I can pull that up here quick. I can find it. Yeah, I, I read that um, and it was really interesting. However, I, I can't imagine, we're, we're not encouraging people on the buses to uh, let students off at other than the curb. However, um, it has been observed during these first few days of school that the buses don't pull snug up to the curb and let students out. So um, my, my concern really is twofold that, um, uh, students or anybody using um, a wheelchair or any kind of wheel device is let off in the in the teacher parking lot and gets out at the handicap unloading zone, which then necessitates them walking quite a distance where they're not under the canopy. And if we're having inclement weather, um, that's a long distance to go before you're under the canopy where the two handicap public doors are to use. Um, and I understand what the architect said about not wanting to create some kind of hazard with students crossing lanes of traffic, but that would not be what I would think would happen if we were to position the curb cut uh, close to the end of the canopy where the pre-KK entrance is. Oh, you mean at the, at the beginning of the bus loop, sort of? Sort, sort of, of like, yeah, well, not... Yeah, yeah. Close, close, close. like so, at the end of the canopy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I yeah I guess I guess we could entertain something like that. I think uh, I think I don't have the thing in front of me that Gary had written. I'm still looking for that. But I think one of the things that that rose some eyebrows was say somebody gets off the bus and they trip over that. 
the edge of that or something, then you're creating another hazard. The other thought is, say, we have to just check the schedule of the buses uh, when they're gone or beforehand for a car to go into that uh, bus loop. Because I think the reason why we separated those two areas was for safety reasons, um, to keep the parent drop off separately, separate from the bus loop. But I guess it, I mean, it's up to, up to it's up to the committee. It's up to you guys. I mean, I, I think I, what I could do is if, if you vote for me to explore that, I could actually reach out to Gary and see what he would do as far as, you know, giving a couple of sketches. It's going to it's going to add it's going to have some cost to it. Um, and then we just have to do diligence and figure out where exactly it should go. So it doesn't cause any potential uh, injuries or negative impacts on kids getting off the school bus, you know, like where, where the bus starts and ends how many buses etc like that so maybe in the beginning like that maybe that is the place to put it chris so we'd have to study that and look at it with you closer and with peter and Great. with gary thank you i appreciate it yeah I, I, and i would I, I would hope that it would be marked in such a way that you know there's a visual marker too for people to see that it's there so they wouldn't make it a tripping hazard you know with some paint and whatnot yeah and then the buses, Here. we have to figure out where the buses are, how often they're going to be there, when they're going to be gone, so that those afternoon or late morning uh, drop-offs can happen, right? Peter, you have some to add? Yeah, so I, I just want to uh, think this through, that mm -hmm. if we're talking about the bus loop, we would not normally have any family drop-off in that area. And Chris, I was thinking that, if we're considering before or near the beginning of the bus loop, we could also think of towards around the end where there's already a natural break in the sidewalk where there's a entryway to the back um, pump house. Um, that's where the, the, the grade allows that. And so that might be a, maybe a more natural place for signage and, and an area, but for buses, we use that entire loop. Um, and so when the buses come in, um, you know, they're end to end and because it's staggered as they arrive, I've seen up to 12 buses in that loop. Uh, and so if we had a student who required any kind of lift or any kind of, uh, you know, grade or, or special entrance, um, they could easily pull just wait and pull to that natural break that's already in the sidewalk that's past the portico uh, and is part of the entrance to the pump house. So just offering that, I, I, I don't oppose it, but I just wanna make sure that, you know, we're not thinking that we would direct on any given day, a family to come in that area, that they, we already have the curb cut and signage in the family drop-off area. Uh, I, I have a different perspective on this. Um, I, I watch the buses pull in and there's absolutely no question that kids get off the bus, walk a couple of steps, step up onto the curb, which is in itself a tripping hazard. The thing about curb cuts is they aren't just for people with wheeled vehicles. They actually are safety devices for all kinds of people. Uh, and and my other perspective on this is that this is a building which we hope is used by the community. This is an aging community. One of the problems we have had at Store Center is that there wasn't easy access to um, close access to places like the health the health offices. Um, we expect that our, the members of the community will use the building out after school and on weekends. And I think making Anybody who's using a walker or a wheelchair uh, climb out of a car at the far end of the sidewalk, wheel themselves through, uh, and perhaps be exposed to, to wet inclement weather, wheel themselves all the way up to the door, uh, is, um, is really going to be a, a hardship on our seniors who, you know, who will be using the building at some point. So I think... I would put the curb cut as close to the main door as you can possibly get it. We'll go Ryan and then Chris again. I guess, so just on this thread, a couple of questions I have. So the observation has been made that the drivers, maybe maybe non-early, some drivers are not, um, 
not approaching the curb uh, in a way that would allow somebody to step off directly onto this, the sidewalk. So I guess the first question is, do we think that this can't be resolved with just sort of better communication and instruction to the drivers about how to utilize that? I, I don't know the answer. I'm not asking a leading question. It just seems to me maybe there's an operational solution to get them to approach it the right way so that you don't have what the mayor is saying is happening, which is you're stepping down on the road. And now you have to step up onto the curb, which I agree creates a, a situation. Then the second question was, um, so I guess to the, to the mayor's second point um, about other uses of the building, the community's use, um, I, I guess that to me raises a larger question of outside of normal school hours, what is the expectation about the use of that loop? If it's not supposed to be used for, for parking and, and, and um, entering the, the building from a vehicle, even evenings and weekends, then I guess, you know, we probably would want to put a curb cut in that encourages use that's not by design. So I, I my assumption was we basically didn't want people parking in the bus loop regardless of time of day or or weekday versus weekend, but maybe that's not the case. So that's just another question I have about what your vision is for the access to the loop. Um, so the first question, um, it's really about the radius of the turn and um, rectangular buses. Uh, so there are some parts of the bus loop that work really well, but depending where you land, you're in a, a curved part, but yet you're a rectangular bus that doesn't articulate. Uh, and so I too was watching that and a majority of the students are stepping off the curb into the bus. That's just going to be a reality with 17 buses uh, that were running and in an efficient manner of loading and moving kids out that we we don't have the luxury of having one bus pull up to a specific flat straight area for kids to load and have that bus go out um, it's a matter of scale uh, ryan your other question and it's a tricky one because you know this is we see this in other buildings and other places um kind of it's a lawless uh, land after hours as to where people park and uh, I was there on Saturday as well with the Board of Education members um, uh, for an afternoon workshop. And I um, I noticed uh, I parked in that loop, to be honest with you. And so I, I apologize to the school board and hopefully the state police aren't listening. Um, but, uh, you know, it is one of those things that I think happens. And I like I think of open houses and the events like concerts. Uh, if I think of the middle school, Goodwin, all of them, it's like, you know, all bets are off as to where you park. Um, and certainly was that case on uh, Little League opening day and uh, it's past Saturday. So. Right. So, Chris, you had another comment? Uh, yeah, um, uh, Peter, just to your point, um, I looked at where that, um, the area you're talking down by the pump house is and it slopes pretty quickly there so it's a pretty tricky place to get out um with a wheeled uh wheelchair walk or whatever but I, I was thinking of that too actually that's the place that I ended up using to offload the passenger I had that had a wheel device um what I'm more thinking about is the function of the curb we have that granite curb there Steve basically to get water to go in those catch basins right that's why we have those granite curbs or I mean if we don't need to have curbing we could take all of the granite curbing out and make that whole area you know just a graded um uh, entrance into the school and that could eliminate kind of what i'm talking about because i'm i'm seeing it being a long distance from the the parking lot and the designated um handicap offload spot to get to the canopy and i'm thinking inclement weather and i'm thinking i'm pushing someone in a wheelchair or i'm using my wheelchair to get in and I know the maintenance staff will be great about clearing the sidewalks, but there's nothing that beats a covered sidewalk in terms of really getting a cleared area. So um, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to create more problem than we solve, but I just wanted to see if there was a way around this that could make it more equitable. Well, Chef, perhaps you could just explore it with your um your consultant and 
Yeah, what I've done is I, I, wrote an e I wrote an email here that the committee would like us to explore it. I'm going to discuss it with him, and I'm going to say we're going to coordinate with Peter Dart, Chris McNamo, just to make sure we get the position of it where we need it from all perspectives. So everybody's happy before we pull the trigger on this. Okay, I guess we start with that and uh, we see if there's some plans. Okay. Okay. If your challenge, uh, just to your point, just have... The challenge is going to be making the safe percentage slope, the handicapped excited. I think you've got some pretty short runs there. It may end up being too steep. Yeah. So just have them check that out. That's okay. where your problems are going to be. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's right. And then drainage, we don't want to cause an issue of anything that water-wise, you know, we don't want any more flooding. So we got to look at right. that too. Or, or a place for ice or anything. Yes. So, uh, okay. All right, we'll get some more information then, but okay. thanks. Email just went out. Okay, thank you. Um, then if it's okay, we can move on to the OPM. Um, Adam. Yeah, so the only things I would add to what's been discussed so far, um, Steve and Jeff touched on a lot of points I was gonna bring up. Um, in addition to uh, some of the wrap up items, we have uh, still some, a fair amount of asphalt that needs some rework. I know that Newfield has been working with uh, the subcontractor directly, Colosso, to get them get their availability scheduled, just because a lot of it is involved in the parking lots and things where people are using it, so it can't occur during the week. So that will either be Saturday work or Memorial Day um, uh, in order to get that work complete. Um, and the other component of it, there was a uh, piece of equipment in the playground that had a uh, had an issue where replacement parts are some are needed. So that's been reviewed with um, both the playground inspector that uh, reviewed it, as well as the subcontractor um, who uh, who uh, found the issue. And so that will be replaced. And that's the the spinning globe um, component. So uh, as as Steve alluded to, there as you get into the new building and things are getting used in their final form things crop up so getting those identified and resolved quickly um it's it's part of moving into a brand new building but um obviously they need to be addressed and then as i said before the uh the drainage basin is uh the, the one of the big site focus focal points to get that resolved and get that training properly okay any questions for adam steve how is the uh, HVAC system performing? I know we were working on balancing and getting all the different parts working. Is that fully operational at this point? It is down to a few little tweaks here or there. And I think in the last couple of three weeks, a lot of issues got resolved. Um, specifically, I can't tell you what's left. Uh, I think the commissioning agent owes us an update um, from last week, which we haven't received. Um, uh, the the commission last I saw the commissioning checklist was I think there was fifteen items either for record or needed to be reviewed or still needed resolution. But for example, things like that uh, VA, VAV calibration issue that's been resolved in terms of getting the, the the points to align, set points in the vestibules in the media center have been adjusted so that way those function appropriately. Um, so it's it is winding down to the last few items to be confirmed. So, uh, but the the big thing is the the cooling because you know, we've had heating for a while, but we only had the two ninety degree days uh, to really get into what the the cooling set points need to be and, and feeling what the environment feels like in a warm environment. Day like today, you don't really really see what that uh, what it needs to be until you're in the building and it's and the heat's uh, the heat's on the outside and the, and the building needs to be cooled. So. Um, it's, yes, it's, it's winding down. Of course, you know, that last mile is always the last, uh, is always the hardest with the check boxes. Great. Thank you. I have a question, Randy. When... Go ahead, Chris, and then we'll have Mary. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was kind of flabbergasted by the Richter Segan report. So I'm curious, um, generally Adam, if that's kind of a normal volume and normal level of issue. And then maybe Steve can speak to the, and maybe both could, to what I think I thought was remarkable too was the the number of uh, of kind of failed asphalt patches and um, issues with asphalt. Again, if that's normal, I am sorry to hear it happens at all, but um, I don't know what the range of this is. But I, it seemed extraordinary to me to have so many problems. I don't know if somebody was new new to the machine or what. I, I can't speak to the the 
why it was more than I would have initially ex expected, but that's why we had Richter so you can go back out there and check to confirm sure. that it was all in place. So, um, yeah, Steve, I don't know if you want to talk to what, what the patchwork and all that. Yeah, I think I'm, I think some of it has to do that, 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 um, contractor was a sub tier sub of a bad performing site contractor. Uh, I think that was some issues based on how they were directed to do work, which may have been adverse to how we wanted to see it done. Um, so that's one of the issues. I think the Richter Segan report, I think a lot of it, we thought we were in pretty good shape and then we got three and a half, four inches of rain. So that kind of didn't help that report. Um, that's all being addressed. Um, Paving still needs to be resolved in those areas that are in question. We've got another site contractor on board, but I'm deferring meeting that though Ben is back from vacation so I can walk the job with them and Ben um, what, to identify the open issues that BB can't seem to resolve and, and move it um, to the finish line. So we'll, we'll have a better handle of that situation, Chris, um, next week. Good. Yeah, I mean, things like painting over the grease uh, fittings and so forth on, on hinges. Um, so it seems like not just one contractor, there were a few, but the, the pavement thing, the, the asphalt just kept coming up again and again. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, yeah, Mary, sorry. Um, my question was along that same vein. I, I agree with you, Chris. I was quite shocked to see that. That's a pretty lengthy report um, of things that aren't finished. So I, I wanted to ask about the progress of those. Um, it is dated 10 days ago, so I didn't know um, what, how many of those things. I think there are... Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of pages, <laughs> some with photographs, but um, yeah, I, I'm not even sure I can give you an accurate number looking at this on the screen, um, but it, it's a lot and it was very concerning to see that. Some of those things are definitely done. I mean, like the trees, they had pictures of the trees that were not in the ground yet, which are, um, I, it, I know that the large areas for asphalt that has been, those have been replaced. I think some of those are like the bird bath areas where they did a, a little patch to um, on the top. Um, yeah. I, I remember. So would we get an update on this same report at our next meeting so that we can compare? Yeah, we're, we're prepared to respond to that report um, with by dates for the things that are left to be I'm sorry, Steve, you cut out. Could you repeat that for me, please? We will um, respond to the report um, with dates on things. And yeah, you'll have an update before your next meeting. Okay. Um, and Colliers will probably have an update and Jeff before that. So they can always forward that to you. I don't I don't think we'll have a formal updated Richter Segan walkthrough before the next meeting. Oh, no, you won't have the... their walkthrough, right. but you'll have our response. Right based on when the work needs to be complete. So for example, it can't happen this weekend given the upcoming rain, you can't do asphalt paving work. So that kills the entire week of completing the work, so. Can uh, I make a, a request on this future report that the things that are taken care of be removed from the report altogether? Yeah, if, Chris, that's it, been problematic through the whole job is, is things that are- I know, so let's start it now, even if we couldn't start it before. Yeah. Um, just so it's clear, these are the issues we're focused on that are still an issue. Adam, is that a possibility? Yeah, yeah. Great. I just want to focus and have everybody focused on what needs to be done, not what was done and is it done now and all that. Okay, uh, any other questions for oh, Madison? Yeah, I know I missed, um the meeting two weeks ago, but uh, I wondered if I didn't see um, if there was an update about privacy fencing and if there was a progress on that or a decision about that. 
Um, not yet. Not yet. yet. Yeah. Okay. Randy, what's the hold up on that? Um, so Adam and I visited, uh, we've looked at the area. Um, partly we're struggling a little bit with exactly what the resolution might be. Um, uh, because there's one area where there is a little trail and there's, you know, there's some, there are legitimate questions. Um, putting in a fence may kill trees. <laughs> so uh, it's just, um, I did some outrage to Richter Segan to, to broach the topic, and that was one of the major concerns, is getting some sort of fencing that addresses the issue without separating the site where you also no longer can see into the into the ropes course in that wooded area versus having it closer to the property line and potentially ripping out a bunch of trees just as you install fencing and posting. So that's, yeah, uh, we just, we've just met with the major, one neighbor recently and, and walked that property line to review it. So that's... Uh a proposed solution is still in line. Adam, remind me, I did see a sketch where that line of the fence was going to be taken over the ropes course that was that's existing that's been there. Is that no longer the case? Are they thinking of moving it back down to the property line or what? There, there was no real plan. That was a hypothetical. Okay. Okay. Uh, what what would happen if we did this? So. Well, thanks, Adam, for and and Randy too for taking it so carefully. <laughs> Okay. All right, then I think we can move on to um, pay out. Invoice. There should be procurement. Oh, first. sorry, procurement. <laughs> sorry. So there's nothing to nothing to vote on um, this this evening, but I did want to provide the update. Um, so there was one item uh, approved on an expedited basis. Um, this was for uh, one set of tests at the drainage basin where our Typical testing lab IMTL um, didn't have the personnel available to perform the, the one test for, uh, requested by the civil engineer. Um, so we got a proposal from a, an alternative testing lab to, to perform that work. So that was approved by the that's, subcommittee. Yeah, that's uh, for per percolation at the pond. Correct. Correct. Um, so that's the only item on, on procurement. Rain garden. On Rain that. garden. Yes, right. <laughs> It will be the rain garden. And then we have uh, the invoice packet. Um, so for tonight, we have um, invoices from Collier's, uh, the Hartford Current for an RFP advertisement for the monument sign, um, Langan, uh, who has a partial invoice for the new asbestos management plan, and then uh, TSKP. Uh, their invoice number 35 for a total of $52,014.64. Adam, can you say, I didn't hear what you said about the Hartford Current and the, I see it says monument sign. So the uh, the base project scope did not have the that monument sign that we had looked at with the, the five foot by five foot. Um, mm -hmm. So that, is put out to, to bid. So as part of that, you put in the advertisement in the newspaper. So that's what that's for. Perfect. Thank you for um, clarifying. There will, that. there will be another one next month because we're putting it back on the street uh, here shortly because there wasn't any bidders the first time. So you'll see that one again. Good to know. So then I would um, like to make a motion to approve, excuse me, the invoice packet dated today, April 27th which includes invoices from CPL, the Hartford Current, Langen, TSKP, for a total approval of $52,014.64. Okay, there's a motion, is there a second? Second. Rich, thank you. Any final questions? And all in favor of approving uh, the motion, please indicate. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Okay, then that brings us to adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? Mary, I'll thank you. Adjourn. Okay. And I'll have Chris Kiefner for second. Great. And all in favor, you can indicate and sign off and we'll see you next time. Thank you all. Thank you, Randy.